Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Taylor, and uh, we're here at the last day of the 22nd Croix here in Seattle, Washington. And today we're talking about uh, metabolic uh, complications of HIV. And I'm here with um, Dr. Pablo Tebas, Dr. Allison Eckerd, Eckerd and Chris Longenecker. Right, Chris Longenecker. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate this. Um, so, you know, metabolic complications have been kind of a uh, complication of HIV disease for, for a long time now. And what um, this year stood out for you at Croy? Uh, well, I think there were a number of very interesting abstracts. Uh, a lot had to do with um, fat accumulation and obesity and the link with inflammation that we know is bad and leads to a lot of the complications in HIV. Yeah, and in fact, this has not been a cry of many news, but mm -hmm. in the area that had been more news, I think, has been in the, in the metabolic area. I think increased cardiovascular risk is an issue. There has been major presentations, and the benefits of the statin seems to be very real, even in patients that don't have some of the traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. But this morning, uh, the group of Steve Grispoon and uh, Law presented data with the effects of statins on, on plaque inflammation and stable plaque, which was interesting. Uh, Grace McConsey presented data on fat changes in one of these great big uh, SCTG studies, but also data on the use of rosuvastatin, which is mm -hmm. another statin, in, in markers of inflammation and, and cardiovascular risk. In, in, so I, it, w it was really, uh, there has been a lot of focus on metabolic issues. Yeah, and as a cardiologist, I think we've been talking about this issue of cardiovascular disease and HIV for a long time and trying to get at the mechanisms. But finally, we have some emerging data that there are treatments, particularly statins, are, are, are going to be very helpful uh, in this population. I think the, the other thing that, uh, that was interesting to me is the risk prediction um, uh, for cardiovascular disease. Um, we, did, we haven't had good models in the HIV-infected population, and, and there were some studies to, to suggest that, uh, that maybe we can uh, come to that by using modifications of some of the existing uh, risk uh, equations that are out there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's been a very, very strong cardiovascular uh, Meeting, session. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about cardiovascular, there, we, I think everybody was waiting about the NACOR data, about Abacavir and the cardiovascular risk, we have been talking about this for a decade now. And, and, uh, so then a core, which is a large cohort of uh, sites, is, uh, the Center for his Research Sites in the U.S., follow patients that were on Abacavir or not Abacavir regimens uh, to try to answer the question that was has been posted uh, for many years, uh, the, of the association with Abacavir use and myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, was an interesting, it was not selected for an oral, which I cannot believe the committee didn't do it. Uh, and the poster was, it was a little bit confusing, it's like the Bible. It, you, can, <laughs> you can read it however you want to read it, and reach a conclusion that you want to uh, reach. But, so, when they did the analysis, uh, the same way that they did it, mm -hmm. they saw this, this signal that Abacavir might be associated with increased cardiovascular risk. When they controlled for all the cardi non-cardiovascular risk, that risk attenuated to mm -hmm. the point that it was not statistically significant anymore. They didn't do the more sophisticated uh, mm -hmm. modeling, that uh, marginal structural modeling that really corrects for all these in inherent bias. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and they are thin I think they are working on that. But I, I th we were hoping clarification and we didn't get it. <laughs> but it's becoming a little bit all um, I think if there is a signal, it's very tiny. And yeah. when you compare it to traditional cardiovascular risk factors like smoking mm -hmm. and, and hypertension and, and hyperlipidemia and diabetes and, and renal disease, right. which is, uh, is, is very small. Well, yeah, certainly now that um, Abacavir and Formatrimic is back on a, as a preferred regimen on, on the uh, and the guidelines, I think it's important to, to get this answer, and hopefully, as you say, they'll do some more sophisticated modeling, we'll have an answer maybe by this time next year. Yeah, yeah what struck me about NA Accord, besides the back of here, was the renal oh, the effect, renal. the hazard for, for, for GFR or, or kidney function that was very low um, was striking. Mm -hmm. um, and I th we see that in the general population, and it's, it's not just uh, vascular disease, but renal disease is a risk factor for heart failure, 
heart failure that's not due to myocardial infarction. Right. Um, and, and I think going forward as the population ages, as the HIV infected population ages, heart failure is going to be a big problem and renal disease as is a major predictor. Well, I think certainly in the long-term survivor population, people have been on so many kidney toxic drugs for, for so many years that there's going to be a lot of underlying disease. Even if they're not seeing it, they're, they're normal lab values. I think it's important to be aware of that. The other thing, metabolic thing, when we're talking about metabolics is they presented the data of with TAF versus TANOP. Mm -hmm. And this morning, it was presented around two hours ago. And what is your take on it? Uh, I was less impressed uh, in the difference between tenofovir and, and TAF than I expected to be. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit underwhelmed by the difference, but I don't know. I, I think some data you know, still remains um, that we don't know about, but I was impressed with the decrease in um, tubular dysfunction and some of um, those comorbidities. So maybe in the long run, it, it yeah. will be more beneficial than... And yeah. I think if, for, in patients who are at highest risk, yeah, it's going to be important. The question is going to be if, if, the, differ if the delta that you mm -hmm. get is enough to justify using a brand name drug versus yes. a generic drug that yeah. mm -hmm. would be. The other thing that was a little bit, to me, sur surprising, although they presented that, Paul Sachs presented that, and a little, a little confusing, is that you lose the benefit of the lipids. The of it lowers your lipids. Mm -hmm. Tough because you have lost, lower mm -hmm. levels. It doesn't lower your lipids. So how are you gonna balance bone mar I mean, better for bone, better for kidney, worse for lipids. Yeah. And making mm -hmm. that decision is going to be mm -hmm. interesting in the future. Yeah, um, and uh, aside from TAF, there were some, abstracts that looked at switches, you know, from a PI to a, a more lipid-friendly mm -hmm. uh, regimen as opposed to starting statins. And, and it looks like in most cases starting statins is just a more robust way to go. Um, and, and I think as time goes on, more and more of our patients will be put on statins. Well, and speaking of switches, do you think that uh, newer new sparing regimens might be uh, one way to address some of the, the issues, especially with uh, kidney and, and bone health? Um, I think that uh, it certainly show, you know, some of the abstracts show that um, they are virologically non-inferior and, and may have um, some decreased uh, yeah. comorbidities in the I long run. I still have some questions about the new experience regimens. I mean, the NEAT study, although it showed non-inferiority, mm -hmm. there was a suggestion of more biological failures on the mm -hmm. new experience regimen. So I think there is still a, and it might be dependent on that particular regimen that mm -hmm. I think it was Darunavir, Ritonavir, or Alteravir. Yeah. Right. Uh, and maybe with other combinations that include, I mean, Dolutelavir with Ripivirin or something like that might be better. But I think, I, I, I still think that there is something about nucleosides that is powerful. And I don't think we are ready to abandon nucleosides yet as first line therapy. And in fact, you no know, guidelines have a nucleosparin regimen as preferred regi initial regimen. So I still have to see more data to be convinced that they, and I am sure that eventually we will find a regimen that is nucleosparin that will be <laughs> as good as uh, New container, not yet. We need some time to, to do that. There were other things in, in metabolic that I thought uh, were interesting. I, I was, what do you think about this uh, metcholine metabolism? The, uh, the study that was presented this morning about, uh, what is your take on it? What yeah. do cardiologists think about what we eat? <laughs> well, should we uh, be a vegetarian? Should we become a vegetarian? <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm from Cleveland where uh, a lot of this work has come out of Stan Hazen's lab at the Cleveland Clinic, um, showing in the general population that TMAO is, is a pretty significant and strong predictor of outcomes in patients who have coronary disease um, and heart failure. And so I think there needs to be more investigation and perhaps in a, in a larger study such as Reprieve, if you're able to look at association with, with real outcomes. Um, I, I, uh, I think the jury is still out, but I think in HIV, clearly um, the gut uh, is important in, in pathogenesis and um, potentially in uh, 
you know, mediating cardiovascular disease. And so, I, I love those studies. For the audience that might not know about this, is that there is a metabolite of the colon metabolism. So, there is something that is uh, that is metabolized by bacteria in the gut that when it goes into the circulation is associated with cardiovascular disease. So this idea that by eating a lot of meat, you might be increasing your cardiovascular risk, there might be a biological basis for it. And, yeah. I, and, and that's what I think is very really neat. But in this study that we presented this morning, there was no association, but it was no. not with heart cardiovascular events, it was mm -hmm. with some... There, there are difficulties with the assay as well. So it just, we'll have to see. That was an interesting, I thought. And, and I think just the microbiome in general um, and, and seeing how that affects cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes uh, will be an area for investigation in the future. Uh, well, certainly we've heard a lot in the past about the role of microbial translocation and not just the good things that the gut can do yeah. but in the setting of HIV. There's uh, some bad things that can happen. Is, was there much on that this year? Um, there, there's some. Uh, we, look, we look at all these inflammatory uh, Mark, things, uh, but... It's, it's, yeah, it was very cross I, I, I still think there is a little bit early. One other thing, I mean, we, in cardiovascular disease, and you're a cardiologist, I mean, I, patients with HIV have higher frequency of traditional factors, particularly smoking, particularly in Europe. And some mm -hmm. of the back of the data, you have to look, the DAD data, you have to look at it high frequency of smoking. There was a study presented looking at strategies to stop smoking, which yes. was interesting. I think it was a good study. It was a randomized French study. Yeah. And it worked. Um, it, it works. Only What's disappointing is that, people. you know, um, a, still a very large number of people, 80% um, or so, still were not successfully able to quit smoking. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult. And at least we have maybe a tool that we could use to help I think just back on the on the whole issue of, of, of the microbiome and the bacteria that are living in your gut, I think has very uh, interesting implications in various parts of the world, um, because clearly the the bacteria that you have is different depending on where you, where you live. And in sub-Saharan Africa, where the largest burden of HIV is, um, there could be some very important contributors to inflammation from from the gut microbiome. And that really hasn't been studied in that. Has not been studied uh, as well as certainly as, as the U.S. and European populations. Yeah, sort of along the same lines of nutrition, there were some interesting abstracts looking at inflammation associated with body mass index mm -hmm. and weight accumulation, where we know that um, inflammation is bad. And so if you start out undernourished, your inflammation actually goes down as your body mass index increases and your fat accumulates. But if you start out obese or you start out overweight and you become obese, your inflammation actually increases. So I think there was a lot of um, emphasis on maintaining a good uh, body weight and, um, and uh, not going into the obese category. Yeah, and I think for patients especially, it's refreshing to see that there are lifestyle changes that they can make that could drastically improve their health, more than perhaps adding on more drugs, which many are reluctant to do. I mean, tr treatment benefits patient, and but when you are suppressed, yes. stay healthy, doing exercise, mm -hmm. eating uh, judiciously, and, 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 and quit smoking, uh, quit smoking is, 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 is what is going to help more your, your health than any other thing. Mm -hmm. But right. there needs to be more research on how to get people to do these things, I think. So mm -hmm. what are the strategies, what are the interventions to improve exercise habits uh, in an HIV-infected population? There, there are, are reasons, uh, special reasons why HIV-infected patients may um, you know, be more or less likely to um, respond to one intervention or another. So uh, I think it needs to be tested. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and I think it brings up a good point too, as you mentioned about adding medicines. Statins seem like such an easy fix, but we have seen some evidence that it increases insulin resistance mm -hmm. uh, in the Saturn HIV study, and so we do have to be a little bit careful about just adding more drugs uh, to the situation. And HIV patients seem to be more susceptible to rhabdomyolysis and some of the other more unusual ones. 
complications and well, scalp pains? There's certainly side effects to every medicine, and we don't know all the interactions between the HIV meds and, and a lot of these other meds. That's true. Although I would point out that in the Saturn study, uh, the incidence of, of significant muscle uh, problems was very, very low. There was only one patient of the 70 or so who were on statins uh, that developed uh, any problems, and it was very minor. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with you that we have to be careful. I think yeah. eventually it's looking like half of the uh, American people are going to be taking statins. <laughs> yeah. We follow the cardiology recommendations, but they have some side effects. We have to be judicious too. Mm -hmm. They have some side effects, and uh, we com don't completely understand. And in patients with HIV, because they take drugs, some of them with very significant interactions uh, might increase the exposure to to statins. You, we just have to be careful. Mm -hmm. But I think be more aggressive with cholesterol and follow probably applying the new guidelines will definitely to the HIV population mm -hmm. will definitely be a, a way to try to address the increased cardiovascular risk in this population. Uh, what I found interesting was one of the posters that you were co-author on, because I'm very interested in vitamin D supplementation, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of observational studies have shown improvement in metabolic outcomes, um, but in the general population it doesn't seem to always hold up when you do a randomized controlled trial, which is what you found in the HIV population. Uh, 5280 is a study of the ACTG that gave very high doses of vita vitamin D, 4,000 units. The recommendations are around 600 units a day, 4,000 units a day, vitamin D and calcium to patients that were starting uh, uh, a regimen that contained uh, tenofovir. I mean, it was a triplet. Um, basically, to see if we could prevent the bone loss that is associated with the initiation of antiretroviral therapy, particularly tenofovir containing regimens. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was a beneficial effect of t taking supplementation of vitamin D and calcium. It decreased the bone loss. It didn't completely obliterate it, but it decreases the amount of bone loss. And we were hoping, because there are papers that suggest that if you take vitamin D, your risk of diabetes is less, and if you take vitamin D, your lipids and some markers of inflammation go down. It didn't happen, and I mm -hmm. think it's important to do prospective randomized trials. Because uh, I have done a retrospective looks at a vitamin D supplementation, and it seemed to protect against the incident cases of worsening insulin resistance and diabetes. But the problem when you look back is that the patients that take vitamin D supplementations are more health conscious, are doing exercise, are the same patients that are uh, eating a healthy diet. So basically, you can get a very biased response. So in the prospective trial for one year, mm -hmm. follow-up, we didn't see an effect right. uh, in, in improving insulin resistance and improving some of the inflammation markers, which I think tells you that it's important to do pr prospective evaluation of interventions. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. maybe you need more time to get see the benefits. Time or, or a higher dose or... Well, higher dose. It's this is 4,000. <laughs> <laughs> this True. is a very high dose. It's a high dose, <laughs> but, you know, it depends not so much on the dose, but where your 25-hydroxyvitamin D level actually goes well, for some of, <laughs> some of these outcomes. I'm still holding my hat on the vitamin D, <laughs> so <laughs> I think a little more time. Uh, to look at some of those things may be necessary. I think vitamin D is, is beneficial and um, probably and having a, a high vitamin D levels for about 30 is a good idea for your immunological benefits. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was also faith. And in the, you know, in how a lot of things come and go, yeah. vitamin D was very high uh, for the last few years. And it every, all my patients, HIV and non-HIV, were asking me for their vitamin D levels. And yeah. Uh, but it's, it's important for growth. I yeah. try to convince my kids to take vitamin D <laughs> at home uh, and put it in the salad in an oil of this. But, uh, and it seems to help people to become taller. Oh, well, there you go. I Not for us yet. I read a paper that asked, you know, the tallest nation in the world are the Netherlands mm -hmm. on average. And the reason is because they, they are the nation that drinks more milk that is supplemented with vitamin D. vitamin D. And the change started in the last 40 years because that's when they started the to, you, to the supplementation of the, the milk mm -hmm. because I think they were overproducing and they wanted the <laughs> population to eat it. But if you go to a hospital in the Netherlands, people, when, when they eat lunch, they don't have Coke or they, they have, have milk. 
which is pretty curious. I read an article about this and I was so impressed. So by that time, they might be good. Well, <laughs> obviously there's no magic bullet. And I, I think that statins, you know, with vitamin D, you know, I think it's going to be a multifactorial mm -hmm. solution, particularly emphasizing lifestyle modification and, right. and you know, the other things that you mentioned. Yeah. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you all for this, this very lively discussion, and uh, I guess we should all go home and have a glass of milk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>